yeah let's start off with our uh, module first subject uh, which is the quantitative methods come can uh, it contains almost 12% weightage so translating it uh, around 28 questions is what you can expect in the exam 14 in the morning and 14 in the afternoon and uh, these are the topics these are the typically a CFA calls them as readings probably you can treat them as chapters so these are the eight chapters that are uh, constituting the quant time value of money discounted cash flow applications actually they are a part of finance but yes from a CFA curriculum standpoint they go into the quant but after that statistical concepts probability common probability distribution sampling and hypothesis testing these five chapters they are actual quant and statistics right even in level 2 there are three key statistical chapters regressions simple simple regression multiple regression as well as time series analysis again which are purely stats oriented which means stats and quantitative understanding plays a very key role as far as uh, uh, investment analysis profession is concerned so here we will be dealing with uh, these five stats areas and uh, the last of these chapters again is technical analysis which is again a finance based uh, chapter but still there is some kind of a numerical calculation that is being done so still classified under the quant so these are the eight chapters as far as cfa curriculum is concerned and uh, the 28 questions will be coming from these eight chapters together so today uh, we will start with the statistical concepts and market uh, return the reason being uh, the first two chapters require the usage of a financial calculator right probably uh, uh, i'll wait for one week uh, to start those two chapters because it requires a financial calculator so the other stats related chapters is what we'll start off with right and probably towards the end we'll take those two because if we have to move into other chapters other subjects especially corporate finance or equity or fixed income any of these uh, subjects the financial calculator plays a key role right i can very well uh, take those things in excel sheet and solve them from my side but if you do it parallelly it becomes a kind of value addition so i'll wait for a week or two in in case uh, someone uh, in case some of you are purchasing it probably you can do it parallelly with me Otherwise, I would be giving you the process of uh, doing it and in the form of a recording, which you can very well practice it at a later date also. Alright. Now, this chapter primarily focuses on the basic statistical aspects. Very basic concepts on statistics. If I have a very basic data with me, what are the various calculations which I do on the data? Now, for what purpose statistics is used in investments and finance? There is a lot of data on which we work. Right? Probably a stock market data. Or the bonds performance data. Or any sales price data. Sales of a company for the last 20 quarters. Some kind of numbers based data is there with me. Now, using those numbers, I have to do some calculations and I have to make some statements. Probably, I have to make a, uh, let's say I make one statement saying, Infosys gives more returns compared to Wipro. A very general statement. But, if I have to, if someone has to believe that statement, it has to be tested, right? So, I have to do some calculations on the data and prove it statistically. So, any statement I make, emphasis is more risky than Wipro, share, right? The profitability of Wipro is or some XYZ is fluctuating drastically. I need to have some kind of a base to make these statements. And there is no scientific proof for all this. Right? Only based on the past observations, past data, 
I am trying to do a lot of conclusions. Some XYZ company, the share price will rise up to 400 rupees a share. I am forecasting. What is the base for my forecast? Probably historical data. Along with some other information which I may be having about that company. So what happens is in most of the cases, I have a data with me. Based on the data, I have to make some kind of conclusions. And whenever there is no scientific formula, if I am trying to make some conclusions based on the observations of the past data, I will take the help of statistics. Right? Probably if I uh, say some kind of scientific uh, formulas, the height of a, the area of a triangle is half into base into height. I don't need to look at the past data to establish that formula. There is a scientific proof for that which is uh, given through some process. Or when I have to say a plus b whole squared equal to a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. I don't need past data to establish that fact. It's more of scientifically driven. But if I have to say the returns of Infosys will be much better compared to Wipro. There is no scientific analysis there. Right? Based on the past data or based on some other information churning on the past performances, I am making some conclusions. So, wherever this kind of world comes into picture, take a data, based on the data, make some conclusions, we bring in statistics. And because finance uses lot of data for relating to various aspects, understanding the calculations in statistics and probably making the decisions using statistics is a very important aspect. And that's where we have seen chapters like sampling, estimation, hypothesis testing, which are more to give conclusions to the data. Whereas the initial chapter like statistical concepts and market returns, probability, the next chapter, they are more to do with the calculations world. So I split the whole statistics into two parts. One is doing calculations. Two based on the calculations, making some conclusions. So that is where the two worlds of statistics come into picture. When I talk about the descriptive statistics world, it is more to do with the calculations part. So any data that is present, what all calculations, from what all dimensions I need to look at that data. That is what is the descriptive statistics world. Whereas when we talk about uh, inferential statistics, based on these descriptives, based on these calculations, how do I conclude a statement? How do I make one statement which is primarily the, the job of sampling, hypothesis testing chapters? So we'll uh, understand once we move to those chapters, we'll understand how do I make a conclusion based on these Calculation. So, the whole world of statistics, if it has to be understood in a simple way, it's about all about various calculations and concluding the data based on the calculation. If there is no conclusion about the data, then probably we don't treat it as statistics. Right? Probably uh, as good as the exit poll results. This particular party will win these many seats in this particular state. Purely statistical, where one sample of data is collected. Even when we talk about uh, the Infosys Wipro, I cannot take every minute share price of Infosys. I will take only some sample. Right? I do some calculations on that sample. But when I am making a statement, it's not about the sample. It's a generalized. Sometimes we see, right? Average height of an uh, American male is 5 centimeters more than an Indian male. Do we think that uh, every Indian's height is measured? Did they come to you or to me and uh, take my height and take your height? No, right? 
only a sample of data is being observed. Probably the way they have taken the sample is on some random basis. One of your friend's height might have been taken but not yours. On some sample basis, the data of an Indian person is taken, Indian group is taken and a US group is taken. They have done some kind of average of this group, average of this group. Using some statistical techniques, they have made the conclusion. But the conclusion need not be necessary of that group. Conclusion is a generalized conclusion. That is where statistics helps. Take a small data, but when you make a conclusion, make it as a general conclusion. That is what is the world of sampling, estimation, hypothesis testing, which we will uh, look at uh, after 3-4 chapters. Right? So, the, this particular chapter is primarily focusing on the calculations world. When I am given some data, what all I can calculate on the data. Right? Now, here some of the basic uh, terms which we would be using are population versus sample. If I am taking entire data, whatever is specific to my question, specific to my research, if I take the entire data, I call it as a population. If I take only a subset of the data, I call it as sample. And statistics works only with samples. Right? Uh, sometimes uh, what uh, people try to do is, this is a very common mistake also. They take uh, the average of all the people in a class and say that is statistics. There is no nothing to conclude. There is nothing to generalize from that. Right? It's a full data that is taken. And the average of the full data is that one. But if I take average of only 30-40 people in that uh, class of 200 and based on that say the average of this class is this much. Then using a small set of data I am making a big conclusion. That is where statistics comes in. Right? Otherwise, I treat it as analytics. If I take the whole population, calculate, it's more of analysis or calculation. It's nothing to do with statistics. So, statistics works exclusively with samples. And any factor I calculate on the entire population, like average or standard deviation, median, we'll talk about all those things. Anything I do a calculation on the entire population, we call it as parameter. And the same done on sample, we call it as sample statistic. The average of a sample. The median of a sample. Wherever I am doing something on a sample, we call it as a sample statistic. The same done on an entire population, we call as parameter. So, one more uh, thing we have to be comfortable with. Now, with any data that is presented with to us, the first thing which we generally do is prepare a frequency distribution for that. What do I mean by the frequency distribution? It's just a tabular arrangement of the data. Grouping. Let's say, I have this data. There are different uh, kind of students who have taken the exam. These are the marks. Now, when I say I have to create a frequency distribution, it's nothing but grouping. Probably, how do I create a group? 30 to 40, how many are there? 40 to 50, how many are there? That's what we call as a grouping of the data. Right? So, it contains two elements. One is uh, the class interval. Any data we observe, probably if I am taking the stock price of uh, Infosys for the last 200 days. Again, I will group it. 2000 to 2010. How many, uh, how many uh, instances are there? 2010 to 2050. How many instances are there? So, here we would be looking at the interval, class interval and frequency. That is what we do as a part of the as a part of the frequency distribution. Now I say for this example if I have to create 
I say 30 to 40 or probably 40 to 50. 50 to 60, 60 to 70, 70 to 80 and 80 to 90. This is what uh, the question is asking. Construct a frequency distribution from 30 to 90 with 6 equal sized intervals. So these are 6 intervals I am constructing. Now, one thing we have to remember is, in the construction of these intervals, there should not be any overlap. They should be completely, mutually exclusive. Now, here, 40, if there is a number 40, where does it go? It goes only here, not here. That's one property in defining this frequency distribution. Though I say 30 to 40, it is like up to 40. But just less than 40, probably 39.999. Up to that it goes there, but the actual 40 comes as a lower interval itself of the next class. So now, probably you can quickly classify the things. So between 30 to 40, the frequency is 1. Whereas uh, 40 to 50 also it is 1, 50 to 60 it is 2 because the data is already ordered. We can quickly count also, right? Then uh, 60 to 70 I have 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 70 to 80 there are 5 and 80 to 90 there are 3. This is my typical frequency distribution. When I say I am creating a frequency distribution, this is what I would be creating. So a set of class intervals, the frequencies of each of the intervals and I have to make sure that the class intervals are non-overlapping and probably contain all the possible values. Right? Now let's see something uh, before we move forward. So, it is a tabular presentation of the statistical data, which we have done. Grouping of the data into different classes or intervals. And data must belong to only one group. That 40, it should not belong to two groups. So, I have to create the groups non-overlapping. Only one group the data should be belonging to and all the intervals are mutually exclusive. That is a couple of things which we have to take care while building this frequency distribution. Now, once we have built the frequency distribution, probably some calculations also happen on the data. Right? So, what I will uh, do is, what I will uh, do is, yeah, let me take these uh, class intervals. If I say 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, 60 to 70, 70 to 80 and 80 to 90. And in this case, we are also talking about uh, frequency 1, 1, 2, 8, 5, 3. 1, 1, 2, 8, 5, 3. So, this is our typical frequency distribution. Now, on this frequency distribution, these are what we call them as absolute frequencies. Term wise, for each class interval, what is the frequency? Which is what is called as the absolute frequency of this particular class. Now, we also talk about a word called relative frequency. Which is more like every class, the particular frequency, I divide it by the total frequency. So, it's like in percentage terms. What is the frequency of that class in percentage terms? So, this is as good as I saying 1 divided by whatever is this total sum 4, 8, 12, 8, 20. So, this is going as 0 0.05 or probably 5%. That is what I call as the relative frequency of that particular class. So, it's in relation with the total what is the frequency? So, instead of establishing that in uh, absolute term, I establish it in percentage term. So, probably this is like 40 percent. Right? So, 8 out of 20. So, 40 percent. 
so like that that is one more aspect of calculation on the frequency and this plays a very key role as far as probability is concerned we'll come to that in the next chapter but relative frequency plays a very key role when i translate it into the world of probability then the another calculation which is typically done is cumulative relative frequency all we are doing in cumulative is add add up to that number so for the first class it will still be the same number itself but from the second class what i'll do is up to the first class whatever is the total to that total i'll add this particular class relative frequency which is like less than or equal to that number less than or equal to that particular class what is the total relative frequencies what is the cumulative of all the relative frequencies up to that what will happen is for the last class it will always be one because you are adding up all the percentages so it's like up to here it is 0.1 because 0.05 plus 0.05 whereas for the next here it becomes 0.1 which is up to the previous plus this particular class which is 0.2 now the same logic if i execute it becomes 0 0.6 0 0.851 this particular word called cumulative relative frequency plays a very important role in identifying the patterns in the data statistical distributions is what it is called or probability distributions is what this is called we'll we'll talk about them probably you must have heard of names like normal distribution binomial distribution all these terms so this cumulative relative frequency plays a key role in identifying those aspects so that's where we need to understand once we have any raw data in place how do i calculate the relative frequency and cumulative relative frequency because they play a very key role in identifying the shapes of the data right the moment i plot some graphs it will show me the shapes of that particular data so these are some of the calculations which we do on the data so just uh, quickly going through it absolutely